welcome to North Shore Fellowship's online service. We are glad that you have tuned in. If you're watching on Facebook, would you click like and share? And if you're watching on YouTube, would you share the link with a friend? And if you are in the area, consider coming to one of our in-person services. We have two locations, Fairhaven and Homedale, New Jersey. But for now, let's lean in to what God has for us today and ask a blessing over this service. Father God, we thank you for this technology and we thank you that you are using it for your purposes. We pray that this service is a blessing to everyone who hears it. We pray that you warm our hearts, that you keep us safe, that you draw us in to all the good things that you have for us, Lord Jesus. We ask you to bless the teaching today, the presentations, the prayers and the worship. We give you thanks that you lead us into good things. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Let's worship. Welcome to a brand new series, a brand new series called Standing Strong in a Wicked World. And it's a study of the book of Daniel, the book of Daniel. The book of Daniel is one of the Old Testament books that 
according to the Hebrew scriptures, is one of the Ketuvim, which is the account of the history. But according to the Christian Bible, it's one of the prophetic books. Now, it's both historical and prophetic, and Daniel is written around 600 BC, a little bit later than that, as an account of what happened with Daniel in Babylon during the Babylonian exile. So that's kind of the, the setting. Now, Daniel was one of these first several people that were taken into captivity when Babylon came and conquered the southern kingdom of Judah. And what is that all about? So Babylon, under King Nebuchadnezzar, had come to Jerusalem from Babylon, which is current Iran, and came, came in and, and took these people captive, eventually destroyed the temple and stole all their gold and all their precious possessions. And the first wave of exiles was Daniel and these friends that you were about to meet um, because they were from the king's household. Now, Nebuchadnezzar was a very wise king in the sense that he wanted to build a dynasty. He wanted to build an empire that was not just powerful, but was intelligent, was shrewd, was creative. And so Nebuchadnezzar took the best of the people and constri uh, constricted them into their school so that they would have to serve the kingdom. Now, the main character in Daniel is Daniel. Uh, he is the one who wrote the book. Uh, his name means God is my judge. His name was later changed to Belteshazzar by the Babylonians. That's his Babylonian name. But his friends that were taken captive with him were Hananiah, which means Yahweh, God is gracious. Mishael, which means who is like unto God, which is the same as Michael. And Azariah, which means Yahweh has helped. These guys all had their names changed by the Babylonians, and they're known as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego from this moment forward. So the Bible tells of these guys' faithfulness, you know, standing strong while this wicked world of Babylonians was all about them. They were held captive, but in this captivity, they made hope, maintained hope. They stood strong. They were devoted to the Lord, which is key, even in the land of their conquerors. Now, the book of Daniel is unique because it was written in Hebrew and Aramaic, unlike most of the other books in the Old Testament written in only Hebrew. Um, but there's a little bit of Aramaic. Chapter 1 is Hebrew. 2 through 7 are mostly Aramaic. And then back to the end, chapters 8 through 12 are back into Hebrew. And among the highlights of Daniel are these spectacular stories. Are you ready? Number one, the fiery furnace. That account was in the first part of Daniel. Daniel in the lion's den, that takes place in this book. The handwriting on the wall, that also takes place here. The rise and fall of Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonian uh, empire, we see it come crashing down right here in the book of Daniel. And then Daniel's miraculous ability to interpret dreams. And this gave him favor for every king he served under all uh, four kings that he served under. And then Daniel's prophecy at the end of his book, which tells things concerning the coming kingdoms of the Messianic age. So there's so much in Daniel. There's so much to learn from. And it shows how God empowers us, provides for us, and even protects us if we're faithful to him, even in a culture that's averse to the word of God and wicked in all its ways. All right, so are you ready for the book of Daniel? Standing strong in a wicked world. Daniel chapter one. Verse 1 through 2. In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord delivered Jehoiakim to the king of Judah into his hands, along with some of the articles from the temple of God. These he carried off to the temple of his God in Babylonia and put in the treasure house of his God. Okay, so right away we see Babylon comes and besieges Judah and takes away some of the treasures. Now, first, let's, before we get into the rest of the chapter, let's just ask how and why did this happen? How and why did God allow this to happen? Well, during the time of Daniel, back up a little bit, Israel had already been divided. Now, Israel under the three kings of Saul and David and Solomon were united. But after that, the kingdom became divided into the north and the south. The northern kingdom kept the name Israel. The southern kingdom had the name Judah. And they actually had Jerusalem in their kingdom. And God gave these men, uh, these rulers, the kings of both the north and the south, specific instructions and warnings 
through a succession of prophets. The prophets would speak the word of God to the kings. Oftentimes they would be harsh warnings. And they promised if they were faithful to God, that their kingdom would be blessed. But if they were unfaithful, they would suffer famine, they'd have conflict, and eventually defeat. Now the northern kingdom, under the, a series of evil kings, had become so evil and so disobedient that God allowed them to be destroyed and defeated by the Assyrians around 722 BC. So that's over 100 years uh, before Daniel came about. But the southern kingdom of Judah remained relatively faithful, and they were spared mostly because of the faithfulness of a righteous king named Hezekiah. And Hezekiah remained faithful to God. So when the Assyrians attacked in 701 BC, Hezekiah prayed, uh, and an angel of the Lord rescued Judah and killed 185,000 Assyrians miraculously. So Hezekiah was a faithful king. However, he made one mistake, and one particular mistake is that when he had visitors from Babylon come, he showed them his kingdom, and he bragged about the treasures that the kingdom held. That was a kind of a fatal mistake because Babylon never forgot. So here, let's just look at that. In 2 Kings uh, 20, 12 through 18, it says, at the time of Baradak Baladan, the son of Baladan, king of Babylon sent letters and a gift to Hezekiah, and he heard that Hezekiah had been sick. And Hezekiah listened to him and welcomed them and foolishly showed them all the treasure, all of his treasure house, the silver, the gold, the spices, the precious oil, his armory, and everything that was found in his treasure. There was nothing in his house or palace, nor in his realm that Hezekiah did not show them. Then Isaiah the prophet came to King Hezekiah and said to him, What did these men say that would cause you to do this for them? From where have they come to you? And Hezekiah, oh, they have come from a far country, from Babylon. Isaiah said, what have they seen in your house? And Hezekiah answered, they've seen everything that is in my house. There is nothing in my treasures that I would not show them. Well, then Isaiah said to Hezekiah, hear the word of the Lord. Behold, the time is coming when everything that is in your house and that your fathers have stored up until this day will be carried to Babylon. Nothing will be left says the Lord, and some of your sons, descendants, who will be born to you will be taken away as captives, and they will become eunuchs in the palace of the king of Babylon. You see, Hezekiah's pride and conceit put the kingdom and riches of Jerusalem in peril, because word got back to Babylon that Judah had in its possession a wealth of treasure, including the sacred vessels of the temple, and the Babylonians never forgot even a hundred years later. There was a new king in Judah. His name was Jehoiakim. And unlike his father Josiah or the, his predecessor Hezekiah, he was not a righteous king. He was evil. In fact, the Lord said, uh, the word says that he did evil in the sight of the Lord. All right, so you see how this is developing. You have an evil king who's disobeying the Lord, much like the evil king who disobeyed the Lord in the northern kingdom, which has been completely destroyed. So here, we, here it is, this new king, Jehoiakim, and he's doing evil in the sight of the Lord. But God raises up a prophet, not Isaiah this time, but Jeremiah. And Jeremiah preached in Jerusalem and preached to the kingdom of Jehoiakim, and he wrote down the message uh, for Judah. God gave him a message. He wrote it in a scroll. And it was a warning that Babylon would come and invade them as punishment for the terrible ongoing sin unless they repented. And this is in complete harmony with Isaiah's prophecy a hundred years earlier. And here it is in Jeremiah 36, 1 through 3. Let me just read this account because watch what happens. In the fourth year of Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, the word came to Jeremiah from the Lord saying, take a scroll of parchment and write on it all the words which I have spoken to you concerning Israel and Judah and all the nations from the day I first spoke to you in the days of King Josiah until this day. It may be that the house of Judah will hear all the disaster which I plan to bring on them so that each one will turn from his evil way and I may forgive their wickedness and their sin. And then up to verse 21 of the same chapter, Jeremiah 26, um, 36, 21 through 23. So the king sent Jehudi the scroll, Jehudi is the servant, 
sent Jehudi the scroll and took it out of the chamber of Elishama, the scribe. And Jehudi read it to the king and all the princes who stood beside the king. Now it was the ninth month and the king was sitting in the winter house with a fire burning there in the brazier before him. And after Jehuda read three or four columns of the scroll, King Jehoiakim would cut off that portion with a scribe's knife and throw it into the fire that was in the brazier until the entire scroll was consumed by fire. So this evil King Jehoiakim is hearing the word of the Lord that was written down for him as a warning to the kingdom that they should repent so that God could forgive them. And each time a few verses of it, chapters of it would be read, he'd cut that off and toss it into the fire. Well, what do you think happened? As a result, the Lord allowed King Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonian army to conquer Judah and later destroy the temple and take the people captive. And Daniel and his friends were among the first wave of captives taken to Babylon. All right, so that's, that's what happens here. So let's get back to our chapter, the first chapter of Dan Daniel. Uh, pick it up in verse 3. And it says, Then the king ordered Ashpenaz, chief of his court officials, to bring into the king's service some of the Israelites from the royal family and the nobility, young men without any physical de defect, handsome and showing aptitude of every kind of learning, well-informed, quick to understand, qualified to serve in the king's palace. He was to teach them the language and literature of the Babylonians. The king assigned them a daily amount of food and wine from the king's table, and they were to be trained for three years, and after that they were to enter the king's service. Now this is a special elite training school. Nebuchadnezzar selected the brightest and most talented, handsome, and knowledgeable young men to be trained in the highest levels of Babylonian education in order to conscript them into his service. Pick it up in verse 6. Among those who were chosen were some from Judah, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, Azariah. The chief official gave them New names. To Daniel, he gave Belteshazzar. To Hananiah, Shadrach. To Mishael, Meshach. And to Azariah, Abednego. But Daniel resolved not to defile himself with the royal food and wine. And he asked the chief official for permission not to defile himself in this way. Now God caused the official to show favor and compassion to Daniel. But the official told Daniel, I'm afraid of my lord the king who has assigned your food and your drink why should he see you looking worse than the other young men your age? The king would have my head because of you. Now, this is the first test. These four Hebrew young men, under direction of Daniel, they're in the royal school, but this royal school forced them to not only learn the ways of the Babylonian, but eat their food, a diet carefully selected by the king uh, that they were not really free to reject. In fact, the rejection of it, according to Ashpenaz, was punishable by death. And so not only for them, but the, the chief as well. And it's very likely, however, that these kids grew up eating kosher. They wouldn't eat Babylonian food. Uh, they had a special diet that they had received from the Lord in Leviticus 11 in the Torah. Here's what you should eat and here's what you should not eat. And it's very likely that some of this Babylonian food were things that you shall not eat, says the Lord. And so they didn't want to defile themselves before the Lord with this unclean food, even if it came from the king's table, and even if it was, as we'll see in a minute, that it was uh, nicknamed by the New King James Version, the, king de the king's delicacies. I love that word. So chapter 1, pick it up at verse 11 through 14. Daniel then said to the guard from whom the chief official had appointed over Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, please test your servants for 10 days, Give us nothing but vegetables to eat and water to drink. Then compare our com appearance with that of the young men who ate the royal food and treat your servants in accordance with what you see. So he agreed to this and tested them for seven days. Okay, so they, they resolved not to defile themselves with the king's delicacies for 10 days. Now, either Daniel was given extraordinary power of persuasion or this official was kind and benevolent to them. But either way, they were able to not eat the king's delicacies from the king's table and only eat vegetables and water for 10 days. And what do you think happened after 10 days? Pick it up, chapter 1, verse 15. At the end of 10 days, they looked healthier and better nourished 
than any of the young men who ate the royal food. So the guard took away their choice food and the wine they were to drink and gave them vegetables instead. All right, this is a miracle because they put themselves on vegetable and water diet. And instead of whatever high protein or specially designed diet the others were on, they, after 10 days, looked healthier and better nourished than any of the other young men. <clears throat> and they were doing this clearly to honor God and not give in to the pagan influences of the kingdom and the world around them. In other words, they were standing strong in a wicked world and God rewarded them for that. Now, incidentally, there's something called the, the Daniel Fast, and many people do what's called the Daniel Fast. Now, fasting is a way for us to kind of suppress our natural uh, d desires and tendencies to heighten our awareness of God. Um, it's not really fasting for spiritual uh, uh, senses and for spiritual purposes. It's not really about you know diet and losing weight, but a lot of people use the Daniel Fast to, to kind of lose weight, maybe shed a few pounds, just eat healthier uh, for a time period. What's just so funny that uh, according to the King James Version, if they put themselves on this Daniel fast for 10 days, here's what it says in Daniel 1.15, King James Version says, and at the end of 10 days, their countenance appeared fairer and fatter in flesh than all the children which didn't eat the portion of the king's meat. So if you do the Daniel fast properly, you will be fatter in flesh than your friends. All right, let's pick it back up to verse 17. Now, something else extraordinary happened to them as a result of not defiling themselves at the king's table. And listen to this. To these four young men, God gave knowledge and understanding of all kinds of literature and learning, and Daniel could understand visions and dreams of all kinds. So, as a result of, of not defiling themselves, the Lord rewarded them with an immense amount of understanding and knowledge and Daniel with this ability to interpret dreams. And it was a supernatural ability. He didn't even need to hear the dream, as we'll see in later chapters, to be able to tell what the dream was and tell what it meant. And that particular gift elevated him to a level of authority that no one other than the king was able to attain here in Babylon. He eventually interpreted two dreams for Nebuchadnezzar. He interpreted the handwriting on the wall for King Belshazzar. And he also had some of his own prophetic dreams as well. All right, let's go to the last section. Chapter 1 of Daniel, verse 18 through 21. At the end of the time set by the king to bring them into his service, the chief official presented them to Nebuchadnezzar. The king talked with them, and he found none equal to Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, so they entered the king's service. In every matter of wisdom and understanding about which the king questioned them, he found them ten times better than all the magicians and enchanters in his whole kingdom. And Daniel remained there until the first year of King Cyrus. Now that's four kings Daniel remained under. But what did you read? Did you hear what he just said? That they were ten times better than not only the, the other students, but also the magicians and the enchanters of Babylon. And Babylon was filled, as I said, with some of the most knowledgeable people in the world, these impressive magicians. In fact, that's what Nebuchadnezzar did. He collected all the most intelligent people, the gifted people, and he conscripted them into his army. And many of these people were the best of the best in their culture, and they had advanced training in literature and, and language and science and even what was called the magic arts. But they did not know and honor God like Daniel did. And Daniel and his friends became 10 times better, where they were found to be 10 times better than all of these others, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. And this is typical. Many ancient cultures had very impressive architecture or arts or even science that, that it baffles us. How could they have had that level of, of advanced scientific ability, you know, hundreds, sometimes thousands of years uh, before Jesus? But this is typical, but there is never a society that achieved anything of spiritual purposes other than those who honored and bowed to God. And that's also true of today's society. Babylon, in many ways, is like the world we live in today. There's things that the world says you could do. They even say you should do. Some of them even say you must do. 
And God is telling you not to do, not to defile yourself with these things. We see how often how worldly people, even of superior educational training and superior, superior advanced intelligence or abilities, you know, the, 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 the super minds of the world, they find themselves void of wisdom and no joy and no hope. And they leave lives of deep, dark emptiness because of the absence of God in their spirits. And then sometimes we see young people who do honor God with their lives and adhere to his word, and they're overflowing with wisdom and joy and, and extraordinary natural and supernatural abilities like Daniel and his friends. And, and because they honor God and put him first, they become recipients of the wisdom, knowledge, joy, and the power of the Holy Spirit that only comes from him. And it's obvious. Uh, all you need to do is look at, you know, just look at some of the news from your Ivy League colleges compared to some Christian universities like, uh, like Liberty and otherwise, and just compare what you see, especially in recent times. Now, how about you? Are you tempted to defile yourself with the king's delicacies from the king's table instead of honoring God with your lifestyle and your behavior and your priorities? Each of us face those temptations. And what are some delicacies in your life that the world is telling you you could do or you could partake of, or you should partake of, or you must partake of. And God is revealing to you that you must resist them in order to honor him and not defile yourself. Our society is much like Babylon. It shows little or no regard for God's will and encourages people to think and act contrary to the will of God. In other words, not to submit to his will. And that's why there's so much discontent and violence and depression and confusion and despair in our society. And, and, and most people, even Christians, are constantly being tempted by the devil to neglect God's will or to not prioritize his word above what the society is telling us. And we are always tempted to eat of the king's table, to, to imbibe in and, and partake in the delicacies. And these are things that are clearly not of God but the world is offering and sometimes even mandating to us. God wants us to be like Hananiah and Mishael and Azariah and Daniel. He wants us to have in every manner more wisdom and understanding, 10 times better than anyone else that eats at the king's table. And this is available to all of us. It really is. It's available to us if we determine in our heart to honor God above all things, to submit to his word and to not partake and defile ourselves with the things of the world. And I'm talking about the behaviors and the ideologies and the values and the mores and the things that will dictate what we should think and how we should live. If we're receiving those dictations from the world and not from God, yes, we are eating from the king's table and defiling ourselves before the Lord. And the, the Lord tells us, walk in the spirit and do not walk according to the flesh. See, God leads us into deeper wisdom, some hidden strength and enduring joy and helps us to stand strong even in a wicked world. Paul wrote to the Christians in Corinth who lived in a wicked world. Corinth was a wicked world in many ways, yet there was this growing body of of Christians, people who served the Lord, who wanted to honor him, right there in this wicked city of Corinth. And, and Paul said, lay hold of the power of the Holy Spirit, which will help you stand strong in the pagan world that you live in. And let's just close out our time with this scripture in 1 Corinthians 2, verses 6 through 10. We do, however, speak a message of wisdom among the mature, but not the wisdom of this age, or the rulers of this age who are coming to nothing. No, we declare God's wisdom, a mystery that has been hidden and that God destined for our glory before time began. None of the rulers of this age understood it, for if they had, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. However, it is written, what no eye has seen, what no ear has heard, and what no human mind has conceived, the things God has prepared for those who love him. These are the things God has revealed to us by his spirit. Friend, God will reveal to you things by his spirit 
that are 10 times wiser, 10 times more advanced, 10 times more enlightened than anyone who is a friend or colleague of yours who does not call upon the name of the Lord. God's prepared us, each of us, for a life of great things. Do you believe that? Great things in your life, in your lifetime, through you, in the world we live in. So let's not miss it. Let's not forfeit it. Let's not give in to the temptations of ignoring his word or neglecting his will or just going along with the ways of the world rather than the wisdom of God. Let's resist the delicacies of the world and be faithful to God so that his great purposes can be fulfilled in each of our lives in the days that he's given us to live. God bless you. Thank you, Pastor. Good morning. Warmest welcome to you all. Great to be with you as always. Well, welcome to May. Can it be May already? Yes, it can. Hey, a lot of things going on, so let's take a look. First one I'd like to remind you about, and that's our Monday Women's Online Bible Study. Now they meet on Zoom. They meet from 7 to 8 p.m. We have the Zoom link for you there. It is led by Lisa Jeannie and Michelle Hackworth, and they have a new study that they've just begun, Finding Peace Through Humility, a study in the book of Judges. So a great study. Ladies, an easy commute. Just jump on the Zoom call. I hope you'll be able to join them for that. Let's talk about some of our other small groups that we'll be meeting. This coming Thursday is our Young Adults Ministry. Again, they meet the second and fourth Thursdays of the month, so they will be meeting this coming Thursday, May the 9th. It's at 7 p.m. in the upper room. If you have any questions, your contact is Pastor Bill A.C. Just some reminders of some of the things that go on on a regular basis. How about on Fridays? Friday morning is the Friday morning prayer group. They meet at 10 a.m. in the upper room. If you have any questions, uh, we have Sue Avery's email for... Uh, her contact. And of course, later on in the day, our youth group. That's every Friday at 7 p.m. till 9 p.m. Again, in the upper room. And this is for middle school and high school students. Any questions on that? Your contact is Pastor Brian Higgins. Want to remind the guys to be coming up quick, and that is the monthly men's testimony breakfast. It'll be coming up on May the 18th. That's a Saturday. It begins at 8 o'clock in the morning. Of course, it's the third Saturday of the month. Come on out, guys. It's a great time of worship, of fellowship, to get together. We have bagels and coffee and all that kind of stuff. It's absolutely free. It's a great time. I hope that you'll be able to come out and join us. If you have any questions at all of this, your contact is Pastor Bill Acey. And we have his email address for him. Well, why don't we talk about something looking a bit more into the future, and that is it's time to start talking about some of our beach activities. Yep, putting that shore back in North Shore. Well, coming up on June 28th and 29th will be Bridge Fest 2024, and there are two ways that we're looking for people to come and serve. The first is to serve with North Shore Fellowship. Because we're on the Bridge FM radio, uh, Pastor Raphael will have a table down there, and we need to equip that table. So if you'd like to come down, greet some of the people, answer questions about the church and the radio show that's going on. We'd love to have you. We just need to know who you are, when you'd like to serve during that time. Uh, all of this goes to Melissa at her email address, and she'll get you all set up for that there. It's a wonderful time to help represent the church, and it's a terrific event down in Ocean Grove. The second way is just to serve in Bridge Fest in general, and that is this is a very big event that uh, Calvary Chapel of Old Bridge is putting on, so it's a pretty big deal that's happening. If you would like to help them in any of the areas that they're looking for help, which would be children's games, security, table, food, all kinds of different things. If you want to serve there, again, get us your information. We'll get it over there and they will contact you and give you your assignment. So looking forward to being down in Ocean Grove again, being out in the sunshine. And here's the first chance to go ahead and volunteer and get involved in those. Hey, look, there's more than this going on. Best way to keep up is get on our email list. Send your name and information to us at info at northshorenj.org. Get on our mailing list. About twice a week, you'll get something coming in. Easiest way to keep up with everything that's going on. The regular weekly services, just to remind you, on Wednesday, we have Worship in the Word, wonderful time of, of fellowship, of worship, teaching, and prayer. It's in the Upper Room Auditorium, and it runs from 7 to 8.30 p.m. each Wednesday. Our Sunday online services continue at 9 a.m. on Facebook and YouTube Premiere. And of course, our Sunday in-person service is at 10 a.m. in the Upper Room Auditorium. I remind you, of course, that's in Airport Plaza, Route 36 in Hazlitt. We're at the end of the uh, mall where uh, Perkins is. 
go down into that corner, look for the entrance for IEI. We're going to have tons of signs there. You get to there. I promise you'll be able to get, get upstairs with us with no difficulty at all. Well, allow me to take this moment to say thank you. Thank you so much for the financial support and help that we get from so many of you out there. We invite all of you to come and participate in that way, to take just a portion of what God has provided and put it so that his word and his love can go out in this area. We remind you, you can go to our website and pull down on the menu. There's a giving page there. We have a QR code, so it's easy. You just point your phone or tablet at it. It'll take you right to that page. We can even donate by text whatever is the easiest way to do it. But again, we invite you to all come and participate and help support all that goes on here at the North Shore. Would you join me as we uh, pray over the offering that we'll receive later this morning? Dear Lord, we come before you. And Father, we thank you. We thank you for the many great gifts that you give. We thank you for the provision that you provide and ask, Father, that you take this portion back. Take this portion, use it, and apply it as you see fit. Multiply it and direct us. Make us wise for the work that you have for us. Father, be pleased with everything that you see us doing. Father, we thank you and praise you. It is in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. So, hey, lots of things going on. Got small groups, great way to meet people. Got things online for Zoom if that's easier for you. We'd just love to see you get involved. Remember, you're invited to all these things. And it won't be the same without you. So we'd love to see you down there. Have a great week and may God bless you all.
Friend, thank you for being part of North Shore Fellowship Online. I hope that you enjoyed the worship and this message that the Lord has prepared specifically for you and the announcements because those announcements tell you how you can engage with us, connect with us. We want to see you out at one of our events and we'd love to welcome you at the upper room. But also, if you've never given your life fully to God, today's the day for that, to give your life to Jesus. Reach out to me. I'd be glad to lead you into a prayer of salvation. May God bless you. Have a great day.